Good morning. I'll call the February 24th, 2011 meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call roll. Commissioner Leo Molitor. Here. Chair Nora Adukas. Here. Commissioner Michael Wessner. Present. Commissioner Richard Rodriguez. Here. Now is the time for public comments. This is time set aside for comments by citizens on matters not appearing on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item 5, LU100081. Good morning. Good morning. We should have a PowerPoint queued up. Can you all hear me fine? business. Good morning, Chair Dukas, members of the Planning Commission. I'm Jay Dobrowalski, case planner for the project before you, which is LU-10081. The project is a conditional use permit, or CUP, for a new communications facility designed as a faux palm tree. The applicant is also in attendance this morning. The project is located adjacent to the intersection of Santa Clara Avenue and Auto Center Drive in Nyland Acres. It is regionally accessible via Highway 101 and locally accessible via Santa Clara Avenue. The proposed project site is located approximately 600 feet north of Highway 101, which is an eligible scenic highway. The new facility will be visible from the highway. The proposed project site is also located adjacent to Santa Clara Avenue. Existing commercial buildings will screen the facility from view from Santa Clara Avenue. The new 576 square foot communications facility consists of a 60 foot high monopalm with associated ground mounted equipment enclosed by a concrete masonry wall. The proposed project also includes the installation of 12 palm trees and drought resistant vines to soften the visual impact of the facility. When viewed from Santa Clara Avenue, an existing building will screen the equipment area, but the mono palm will be visible. To determine the environmental impacts of the new facility, an initial study was done. Since the facility will not create any significant impacts, a negative declaration was prepared. The negative declaration was posted for public review, and to date, staff has not received any public comments regarding the project. In order for a project to be approved by your commission, it must meet certain findings. Staff has determined that the proposed project meets the findings, and those are detailed in the staff report. Notice of the proposed project in this hearing was mailed to property owners surrounding the project site. Notice was also published in the local newspaper. To date, staff has not received any comments from the public regarding this project. This project was also heard by the El Rio del Norte Municipal Advisory Council and was recommended for approval. Therefore, Based on the previous discussion, staff recommends that the Planning Commission take the following actions. Please note these actions differ slightly from those in the staff report. The 
certify that the Planning Commission has reviewed and considered the proposed negative declaration together with any comments received during the public review process. Certify that the Commission has reviewed and considered the staff report and all exhibits thereto and has considered all public comments received during the public comment and public hearing process. Find, based on the whole of the record before the Planning Commission, including the initial study and any comments received, that there is no substantial evidence that the project will have a significant effect on the environment and that the negative declaration reflects the Planning Commission's independent judgment and analysis. Adopt the negative declaration. Find that conditional use permit LU-10-0081 complies with the conditional use permit approval standards of the Ventura County Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance based on the substantial evidence presented in Section E of the staff report and the entire record. Grant conditional use permit LU-10-0081 subject to the attached conditions of approval as revised pursuant to the memorandum from J. Dobrowolski to the Planning Commission et al. dated February 24, 2011 and specify that the clerk of the Planning Commission is the custodian in 800 South Victoria Avenue, Ventura, California, 93009 is the location of the documents and materials that constitute the record of proceedings upon which this decision is based. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Are there any questions? Yes, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, Jake, I noticed in the uh, initial study and then also in the there's no uh, generator proposed. The question would be, what are they going to use for emergency backup, or are they? Uh, that is correct. My understanding is there is none. Okay, so as far as answering emergency backup, that kind of thing, I, I probably can ask the applicant. Right. Okay, thank you. Just a clarification, Jay. Um, on page three of our report, page one of, of the staff report on six, this facility location is really in the community of Nyland Acres, not El Rio. Online. Yes, that, that's correct. You might want to make that correction. Yes, other questions? Yes, just a, a question. Are there any other t uh, towers like this in the pike now in the process of being approved that you're aware of? I mean, any applications or are we, are we expecting more and more of these? Mm. The applications that are currently in process yes. are are there mostly any for renewals of existing facilities. So th there are no other applications coming in? Okay. Applications. Are you asking whether there's wireless communication facility permits coming in? Because they do come in quite frequently, but what we're really processing for the most part is extensions of existing ones. But okay. All right. right. I, I'm just wondering how many companies are going to continue to build these transmitting towers, these wireless, I'm talking about wireless transmitting towers that right. have to be, there's, they will be coming up from time to time. Is there any reason that these can't be, no, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not even going to ask that question. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that was the presentation of the staff report. Right now it's time for disclosures by commissioners. So at this time I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that's not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose, disclose the substance of that information. Only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. I'll start to my left. Uh, I'm acquainted with the area, but I have no declaration. I have no declaration other than the same thing as being familiar with the area and driving by it. Same for me. I've gone by this many times, but I have no declaration. No disclosures. Uh, so uh, now we open the public hearing, and is there uh, a presentation by, I, I don't have a card. Would you like a card? I would love a card. <laughs> okay. 
and then come to the microphone and please state your name and city of residence. Uh, good morning, uh, Commission. My name is Jesse Gilholm. I work for Synergy Development Services. Uh, our I can barely hear you. I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> Could you start all over again? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, my name is Jesse Gilholm. I work for Synergy Development Services. We have offices at uh, 867 East Front Street, Suite A, Ventura, California, 93001. Um, here today representing the applicant, T-Mobile West Corporation. And I'm available to ask questions or to uh, go into further detail about the project. Um, would like to start by thanking staff for their presentation. And also I have worked on about a dozen projects with the county. It's the first time I've come to commission, but want to thank them for their continued help throughout all the projects. Very um, good crew to work with. So, um, two, two main points I'd like to address um, initially, if I may, is the reason why we chose this particular location and the reason why we chose this particular design. There was a lot of thought and effort that went into doing so, and we did spend the better part of a year uh, looking at alternative candidates before we proceeded with, with this candidate. Um, our initial, uh, the objective was to provide coverage in that particular area, and uh, to do so we needed to find a location to get antennas up in the air. Um, our goal is to uh, make that happen with the least visual impact for, for the community. Initially, we tried to install antennas on the Hilton Hotel across the street um, where there is an existing facility. I think that might have been a question you were going with was can they try to put uh, facilities to, to, together to minimize the number of new structures, and we did attempt that after um, the belief that we could install a facility, and, and we went as far as to create plans, it proved uh, improbable to install a facility on that Hilton Hotel, although there, there already is, um, AT&T is already there. Uh, that took the better of about six months to, to confirm that. Then we did look at the possibility of installing um, antennas along the fake water tower right along the south side of the 101, um, the city of Oxnard jurisdiction. Uh, that proved inviable for two reasons, the location to put equipment, uh, there wasn't too many uh, locations to put ground-mounted equipment. Um, they're st stuck up against the building, and there wasn't anything available within the proximity to the tower that we need. Um, and also, the there was too many antennas to install more without having interference. There needs to be a certain setback uh, between antennas. So that was um, we we attempted to proceed in that manner. There is also another. Uh, fake palm tree in the, the county jurisdiction um, in the Nyland Acres community, half mile to the to the east or so, I believe on Orange or near the street. I don't know if staff knows the, the street, but we did attempt, and that's a sprint facility, we did attempt to come up with something in, in that vicinity, but um, that location didn't uh, work for T-Mobile as it wouldn't provide coverage over toward the Costco area, which was also... Um, significant um, uh, reason for this project. Um, so we ended up at, at the location we are uh, proposing today after, again, about a year of looking at other candidates. And, and as far as the design, uh, we came up with a fake palm tree um, as the least obtrusive design to get antennas up in the air. Um, although there are not... Ideally, when you propose a fake tree, it's within existing trees, uh, which help screen the fake tree. We didn't have that in this case. Uh, what we did have, though, is the general uh, landscape of that Nyland Acres community it does have quite a few miscellaneous place trees of varying heights, some taller than what we're proposing, some lower. So the overall feel kind of did blend in with, with a tree. It's not like being on an agricultural lot with no trees whatsoever and one sticking up. And um, in order to further um, screen the tree, we did propose a dozen live trees to add context, which will be, those live trees will be planted along the property line, um, which will be substantially shorter than the proposed tree, but you can't um, really find 60-foot tall um, trees to plant. Um, so we, uh, we worked with nurseries to find the best way to mitigate that. And we are proposing a varying height of trees along those 
uh, for the 12 to, so it's not a line of one height and then one taller one, but more of a, a varying height. And lastly, the tree itself, we um, did everything we could to make it be a good-looking mono palm. I'm sure we've seen all examples of ones that don't look so so stealth and are very visible as a communications facility. Hopefully you haven't seen ones that do look stealth and serve their purpose. Um, I think one of the main things is having antennas stick significantly far out from the tree um, is, is a design which makes it more visible. In this case, we've taken the number of antennas, which is 12, which is normally proposed, um, minimize that to six, which means we can the arms coming out of the tree can be uh, closer together, not stick out as far, and we just minimize how far out those antennas would stick, so they better screened by the fronds sticking out. Um, and that's pretty much a, a synopsis of why we chose this location and why we chose this design, and a lot of effort did go into trying to come up with the most best solution for the community and T-Mobile, and um, this is where we are. And I do have, I have read the staff report, and um, I do accept the conditions as, as, as revised, um, but I do have actually one question or comment that I'd like a re revision to be made, and I, I didn't bring this up till this morning to staff, so it's kind of last minute, but it's for condition number 19, and it is in regard to the installation of the additional landscaping. And um, the issue is, is that there's the construction of the Rice 101 interchange project happening right now, and they're utilizing the southern 10 feet of the southern property line for a temporary construction easement as part of that, um, their, uh, as part of their construction. Um, that is going to prohibit the installation of some of the landscaping, which is proposed within that temporary easement. So what I would like to propose is that the second paragraph of item 19D be revised to state something along the lines of, um, or another sentence installed stating something like, it's understood that the southern 10 feet of the property line has a temporary construction easement, um, which will prohibit the initial installation of a certain portion of the landscaping and then go on to read as it states uh, the landscaping and screening plan shall be approved prior to issuance of a zoning clearance for construction all required landscaping and then I'd like to install outside the uh, 10 foot construction easement shall be installed prior to issuance of zoning clearance for a use inauguration and then maybe another paragraph stating that the landscaping within the 10 foot easement will be installed within 30 days upon completion of construction of the Rice One, uh, the Rice 101 interchange project. And uh, yeah, I'd like to make that request and, and besides that here to answer any questions or anyone may have. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, the question of the emergency power. Um, the equipment is housed in cabinets. Those cabinets will have batteries in them to provide initial uh, backup power in case of a power outage. Those should last um, around 24 hours. The facility will have a, a generator plug, in which case if there's a power outage which will last longer than the batteries will hold um, or will power the facility that T-Mobile can um, deliver a generator at that time and um, plug it into the gen, uh, gen plug and power the facility. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Commissioner Rodriguez. Um, you haven't, you talked about the landscaping, uh, your proposal to, to um, continue completion of the landscaping that's up against the, the wall of the enclosure. Oops. Um, for some un unidentified period of time, let's say two years. I mean, we don't know when that thing's going to get finished, and it's been going a long time. Um, I guess a question I have, just thinking out loud, is how we're going to know that that is actually accomplished um, two years down the road. 
Um, and what specific landscaping are you prohibited from, from completing there? You, can you be more specific? I, I saw where there was going to be some sort of vine type uh, of uh, coverage along the walls. Is that what you're referring to? No. The, the area adjacent to the proposed facility itself is, is not impacted by the construction easement. Um, that will be installed in, in its entirety, um, which includes the vines around the perimeter of, of that mm -hmm. of the proposed CMU wall to house the equipment and the tree. Um, the proposal consists of the installation of, of 12 live palm trees, some of them um, adjacent to the facility, and then many of them following the property line of the subject property and the adjacent property, which are both owned by the same um, okay. property owner. It's the southernmost trees. It could be one, two, three, four, five, about six of the live palm trees at the southern end of the, of the parcel. So if you have our facility, okay. the one on ones, it's, mm -hmm. it's these guys down here, okay. which may not okay. be so able to be So installed. basically, you're only going to plant half of the palm trees that you're proposing in, in the application at this time? Upon initial construction, yes. And I'm not positive on the, on the exact number of palm trees. I, I'm um, just using, I'm, using your numbers. Yeah, uh, correct. Uh, I have a concern about that, uh, only in that there's got to be some sort of follow-up and some assurance that that's going to get done because part of what your effort is is to soften uh, and blend blend in what you're proposing uh, before this commission. And I noticed in the drawings there appears to be two palm trees immediately adjacent to the proposed. And what's their height going to be? Uh, I noticed that the palms are supposed to range in heights from 8 feet to 25 feet. I need to confirm, but I believe those were going to be the 25 feet tall ones. Those were going to be the taller. That's what I, that's, that's what I thought, and as I read it, I, I'm trying to visualize a blend there. Um, it, it's almost like having a seven foot basketball player and two, three foot, three foot high teammates next to him and trying to, you know, that's not exactly blending. So I guess I'm concerned about the height. Uh, the elevation of the palm is, is, is how was 60 feet um, identified as your height? The initial request is to get antennas at a 70 foot rad center, which means mm -hmm. the middle of antenna being 70 feet. Um, there was, uh, it, it's a compromise. The lower you go, the less visual it will be, um, the least coverage it would provide. I work to, my job is to make everybody happy, the property owner, the, the jurisdiction, and, and T-Mobile and their radio frequency engineer. What we came up with with the shortest um, height, which would effectively propagate, especially over the proposed and existing uh, rice bridge going over the 101, would be a 60-foot tall structure, and that is 60-foot tall top of fronds. Um, with a center line of antennas at, at 52 feet. Um, I'd also like to uh, clarify that the tree will be um, the trunk. It, it's the trunk size that's called out as the 25 feet. So the fronds will stick up above that, um, and that that's how we came to that that height of a 60 foot tall tree is the minimum height that would work for for um, for. T-Mobile and the height of the trees. After working with nurseries, that was what they said is the largest tree that they comfortably install. They said you can go larger, but then you have big problems of them actually growing and taking. And in and, and the long term, a smaller tree is going to grow taller than a taller tree because it, the, the, the way it roots and grows. And So that was how we came up with uh, with. Okay. the proposed um, tree heights. And so I think I hear you saying that the the adjacent trees to the monopalm are going to be planted in the initial project. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner yes. Molotov. Thank you, Madam Chair. What is the approximate transmission range of a tower like this? 
It's dependent on the number of users. Um, if it's out in Kern County, um, it, you know, or Mono County, Inyo County, it can be pretty, uh, or portions of Ventura County along the 126. I know they can put them up, um, and they can cover several miles. Um, in this particular case, it's a little less than a mile um, that they're putting up uh, facilities. They, there is one existing at, I believe it's 721 Mallhart, which is the Time Warner building. There's a, uh, which is off of Rice on the southern end of the freeway. It's a lattice tower that's been there for a long time. There's uh, an antennas on that. I think that's going to be the closest uh, facility. Um, that said, I know there's plans to try to get some type of facility near the Walmart because um, this facility won't cover that far. So it's dependent on variables for each site, but I'd say a little less than a mile for this particular area is, is a good rule of thumb due to the amount of users in the vicinity. And I'd also like to state that I, I believe it's different for every carrier, so that's not a... Which gives me back to the question I was going to ask and then decided not to initially, and that is when you brought up the fact that you were considering putting this tower in an area close to another tower, right? We were considering a, a co-location, which a co is always our initial attempt. For do it. these towers interfere with each other? Do these transmission facilities, if yours is here and, and, and uh, AT&T's is the front of this building, would they interfere with each other? No. If AT&T was there and T-Mobile was here, where I'm standing, they could possibly interfere. Okay. They could also possibly work, depending on how the an antennas were um, <clears throat> were projected. But um, no, if you're 50 feet from, or maybe 100 feet from another tower, then they should not interfere. That said, I know the county does everything they can to require all the carriers to co-locate whenever possible. So again, it's my understanding that as the population increases, we're going to need more and more towers. It could be a correct statement. And I think that's a logical analysis. If you say they only go a mile and that area starts to increase in population, which we're projected to do, uh, which got me back to the question I was going to ask initially that may be crazy, and that is maybe we need a tower park. Maybe we need a facility or a piece of land where you can put these towers and make them full of palm trees. When, when you go to Indio, they have palm orchards. You drive down, there's maybe 20, 30 palm trees down a row. Just a, just a suggestion, it, it must be very expensive for all of your company, I mean all the transmission companies to get land and build towers and buy and either lease or buy that land. I would think it would be more efficient to have them together, but I'm sorry, that's just my comment. Thank you. Is, is this a capacity or a coverage site? I heard you say it was a coverage site. Is it both? There is current, there is coverage out there uh -huh. on the propagation maps. You have red, yellow, green, red being no coverage, yellow being coverage, but um, subject to drop calls and, and really not the capability to transmit data, which is <laughs> a growing use and very common use for phones these days. There is a service of yellow, if you will, in the area. Um, not much green. This will provide quite a bit of green to a high populated use, especially the, you know, the, the shopping center at Costco and, and the Nylon Acres community. So for that okay, reason... Instead of telling me a red, yellow, green, could you tell me, would you characterize this as a capacity or a coverage? Co coverage. Coverage site. Yeah. So, um, so those need to be close in to where... Uh, uh, there's a gap in service, dropped calls, or like you said, no data. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're obligated to to provide coverage. We can't interfere with uh, with their obligation to provide coverage. So um, the only question that I had was about the equipment uh, wall. What kind of graffiti? abatement program uh, do you, are you planning? I think that was the max concern too, is to make sure that it's maintained. 
there is a condition to keep it in com- uh, compliance with uh, well, I'd have to find it. I, I don't believe anything is being proposed like uh, graffiti proof paint or something like that. Uh, I'd have to review the, the conditions right now, but I know that there is <coughs> continuous maintenance on the facility, and if during that maintenance it's, it's uh, the maintenance technician sees graffiti, then they're kind of standard procedure obligated to try to get that taken care of. Also, the property owner, I know, would not stand for having graffiti on his property, so he would also contact the carrier. As far as um, direct measures, I don't believe there's any directly addressing that part of it. Maybe maybe I should address it to staff then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Could we follow up on on just the graffiti um, before we take the next speaker, or do you want to wait until the end? Chair Dukas, the applicant is proposing drought-resistant vines, which would um, prohibit the paint sticking on the, the bricks of the block wall. But um, also the, the project will be con- uh, subject to condition of approval number 17, which is uh, speaks to site maintenance, that the uh, site be kept in a neat and orderly manner. Sure. So it would fall under unsightly. It right. would be unsightly, and so they would be um, obligated. Is there like a graffiti hotline or something? If if uh, is that is that something that uh, could be included or that condition could always be added. Um, mm-hmm. One of the other conditions is to establish an emergency contact person. Mm-hmm. I don't know that graffiti removal is an emergency. I, I would think emergency would be like a fire or something. Right. But I, that, that seems like a, a separate thing. Um, maybe Matt. we can discuss that later. Or Madam Chair, yes. if you want me to address it. Yeah, typically what happens is, okay, you have conditions 13 and 14 regarding complaints. So if we were to receive a complaint, for example, from the MAC, stating that uh, graffiti um, has occurred on the site. They could uh, report that, and then we would contact the permittee, and um, as a part of Condition 17, we'd have them remove the graffiti. Also, because there's a condition compliance account set up for this uh, project, and there are regular inspections of the sites, many times what will happen is condition compliance staff will go out there, and they'll see that's not being maintained. They'll contact uh, the permittees and have them uh, clean up the site, and then they'll go back to a follow-up inspection to verify that they have done so. Okay. Well, without seeing um, specifically the word graffiti abatement and and uh, knowing that it could become a problem and that that was one of the concerns, the the maintenance of the site seemed like a euphemism for get, you know making sure that graffiti doesn't uh, uh, isn't tolerated. It can. Uh, I understand that the the vines um, are might might work, but um, until those are established, I've, I've seen graffiti on ivy on trees. Uh, if there was if there was something that could be included with that, also um, since I have you up, what about that construction easement and that phasing of the landscaping on uh, condition 19B? Uh, is there any way that you could craft something up uh, that took care of that uh, uh, interchange, that construction easement? Re- <coughs> Regarding the uh, landscape installation, um, in in talking with the applicant uh, briefly, it appears that most of the the landscaping can be installed. It's just the uh, the portion subject to construction, and uh, therefore the applicant uh, would be able to plant that that construction area once the uh, interchange project is complete. Um, in terms of uh, a follow up, the um, 
project does have a condition compliance account, and so uh, it will be reviewed to uh, ensure it is in compliance with all of their conditions. Uh, yeah, glad to hear that. Uh, the other reason I, I had a concern about that, Jay, and the applicant is because we talked about the fact that initially upon uh, planting the landscaping, there would be a uh, uh, irrigation uh, system set up to make sure everything takes root, etc., uh, including the landscaping around the enclosure, which would be a vine type of type of uh, type of uh, planting. Uh, however, afterwards it said that, uh, as I read it, that water would be cut off to the palms because they would have, would no longer need it, and. Uh, um, the only water used on the site then would be to nourish whatever vines were around the enclosure. Um, so uh, how is that going to impact irrigation to the site um, with delayed construction and et cetera and partial planting of landscaping over a, some prolonged period of time? Uh, when is, you know, how is that going to occur? Right. The applicant... Um will require water to establish the, the landscaping. However, um, once it's been established, it will no longer require water. So the applicant will have to uh, provide water for longer than anticipated due to uh, construction. I'm assuming we're talking about normal pipe irrigation. Maybe the applicant can answer that as opposed to you know, coming by with a with a, a vehicle and saturating palm trees, uh, or is there an answer to that? Uh, the applicant can address that, but it's my understanding that the uh, the landscaping requires very minimal water, and so that much can be provided. Okay, thank you. Could we have the applicant come forward again and talk about whether or not you're using a water truck or whether you're installing piping? Thank you. Uh, so Jesse Gelhom again. Um, there is existing water service to the property. We will tie into that with a drip system for the irrigation for the uh, landscaping. Okay, and now I've got Chris Williamson. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Chris Williamson, Principal Planner, City of Oxnard. Thank you for this opportunity to stop by. Uh, just wanted to um, state briefly that the city, I have reviewed the plans with Jesse. He's been over to my office probably as much as he's been here. And that's a good thing because, um, as you know, this particular corner with the construction of Rice 101 and the rerouting of Ventura Boulevard uh, around this site uh, will probably lead to eventually, I'm not sure when, um, an annexation that brings Ventura Boulevard that the city built, which is in the county, into the city, and this corner and this property would probably also be annexed. Of course, that's up to involves uh, LAFCO and other agencies as well. But that's the one of the reasons why he's been over uh, talking to us as well uh, on whether and when this uh, area and how much of it uh, might generate an annexation uh, application. In the meantime, the the plans and the facility are fine with the city. They're very similar to our standards. Uh, we may inherit them one day, and, and that's fine. Uh, we certainly hope that that corner will eventually develop into a much higher use anyway with a, a decent building, and, and, that, and that palm tree might look a little big initially, but uh, as the trees grow or we someday get a taller building on that corner, I think it'll fit in uh, in the future. Uh, as far as the construction, I believe the northbound off-ramp, which is the ramp that would go right past this site, is poured, and that's going to be one of the first portions of the intersection that's going to open. So the ability to plant that remaining 10 feet area might be sooner than later. Um, so we wouldn't have to wait two years for the entire intersection to be completed. So um, that's my understanding from the project manager uh, back at City Hall. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Just wanted to state that support for the project. Um, what is the projected completion date of that intersection? <clears throat> Madam Chair, I think I knew I was going to get asked that, and I rushed over here uh, 
you're a fast uh, commission. You're really on your agenda items right away. We usually have half an hour of public comments. And, and so I got here and uh, I didn't have a chance to uh, ask that question. However, every week I do hear the updates. Um, I believe by this spring or early summer, one of the the, 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 the one of the bridges is going to be half the bridges are going to be open. In other words, they're going to build half a bridge. There's really two bridges being constructed, one adjacent to the existing, then the traffic will move to the new bridge, and then they'll tear down the existing and build the second half of the bridge. And that the bridge construction, although it, I don't see it out there, uh, would be commencing relatively soon and could be uh, available, you know, like later this year. And, that's, and one or two of the off-ramps are are nearing completion. So it will be opening gradually different parts of the intersection. We, and, and that will uh, as early as this coming summer. And that's the best answer I can give you right now. The whole project is supposed to be completed, I think, in about two more years. Thank you. Do you have any comments on the conditions? or? Uh, Madam Chair, just they were clear, my comment was clarified, and that is the reasonable ability to not have the monopole stick above all the other trees and look like a sore thumb out there. Um, but given the explanation of you know the feasibility of getting transplants that are viable above 25 to 30 feet, you know sat, answered that question. So uh, it. For the initial period, it might stick up a little bit, but I think in, over time it'll fit in. That was my concern. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we don't need a rebuttal, it doesn't look like. To, to, is there any more closing comments by staff? Any questions of staff? Just one, Madam Chair. Yes. Okay, so, so obviously the applicant and you have had not had time to really craft the language for 19B as far as this. Um, but I'd like to see the commission, if we want to do that, is have them work it out to the acceptance of the director's level. All right? Because we don't have all the details here, and since it was new to staff. Um, so if we make a motion to adopt that, I'd like to leave that authority with the, the director. Is, if that's okay with the other commissioners. Sounds like a good because idea. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, do we need to uh, accept exhibits eight and nine into the record? Do we need to make a motion? Or do okay. Uh, so moved uh, exhibits eight and nine, and specifically, Madam Chair, to recognize the uh, changes to give condition 16, and then also the recommended action number six are the primary changes in exhibit eight. Okay. Second. So, um, excuse me. And, and yes. should we close the public hearing? I'll close the public hearing. Excuse me, just for clarification, Commissioner Westner, did you say condition 16? Yes. It, but that's what's presented in the memorandum you received today, which is Exhibit 8. It says the correspondence from other agencies and jurisdictions, primarily the change from 5 to 14 calendar days of receipt of uh, environmental or written issues. Okay, yeah, thank you. And, and, and another point of clarification, I'm not understanding what direction you're giving to the planning director for um, condition, condition number 19. I was going to do that in the motion. Okay, then. This is just to accept the exhibits. All right, then. So are you are you going to be looking for actual language, or are you just going to delegate that authority over? Delegate that to her. I think you need to also state clearly what your understanding of that addition is going to be in your motion. Okay, but now we have a motion to exhibit, accept these exhibits. Uh, it's been uh, made and seconded. Please vote aye. 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 Now, uh, are we ready to move on to uh, recommended actions? Is there any other discussion? Well. Yeah. All right. Uh, that, no, uh, just a comment. I mean, uh, 60 foot high is 60 foot high, and it's going to stick out like a sore thumb for well into the future, I think. We're kidding ourselves to say it's going to won't be that long. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's any other option as far as the design and requirements of the applicant. So, um, and it's obviously a compromise from the original height request of 70 feet. Sounds like so. That's the only comment I would make. Okay. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept the recommended actions as presented in Exhibit Eight, 
with the additional uh, direction to the staff that language for condition 19B regarding the construction on Rice and 101 uh, be crafted and approved by the planning director with that understanding. I'll second that much. Is there any discussion? Um, seeing none, let's vote. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. And I, may I thank the representative from Oxnard for coming over and letting us know that you're involved in that. And we look forward to more coordination with, with the city of Oxnard and with all the cities in the county. Thank you very much. And also, you're welcome any time because you see how much public comment we get. <laughs> we feel lonely at times. You'll feel different yes. next month. I think that's right. <laughs> you think? I'll have a whole bunch of new friends. <laughs> you feel on your home court. No. <laughs> Uh, now as agenda item six, discussion report by the planning director on board actions and other matters. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dukas, we did give a report back that Commissioner Onstadt has asked for regarding um, the wireless facilities down at Faria Beach. That is dated to you February 24th. It was given to you this morning. I'd be happy to talk about it in further detail if you had any questions. Yeah. Okay. How, how about it? Can can we bring it back when Mr. Onstad is here? We can bring it back. Great. When he's here. Sure. Great. And then we will go on and talk a little bit about um, our field investigation and a site tour of the Simi Valley landfill. And I'm going to leave that to Dan Clemen, who is the manager on that project, to go over that with you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Um, as you're aware, uh, we're going to be conducting the. I'm just going to call it a site tour, although it technically is a public hearing. Um, that's going to be a week from today. Uh, we're going to be meeting at the uh, Courtyard Marriott at 8.30 a.m. And the tours will begin at 9 a.m. And uh, there'll be there'll be a repeat of the tour, if necessary, at 10.15 a.m. We don't know exactly how many people are going to show up. Um, however, uh, we have, well, actually, technically, waste management has reserved a bus that accommodates a number of people, and uh, if the number of people show up exceeds the number of people that can be accommodated on the bus, they'll just make on the next tour. And that's scheduled for, like I said, at 10.15 a.m. And then uh, public comments will be uh, received at 11.30 a.m. at the Courtyard Marriott. Um, in addition to that, the, as you can probably imagine, the documents for the landfill are going to be rather extensive. Uh, the EIR for the landfill, though, has been completed. It is posted on our website. I encourage you to uh, start reviewing it right now. Um, and our goal is to have the staff report uh, ready and available to you and the public by March 10th. That will give you two weeks to review the staff report. Once again, the staff report relies very heavily on the analysis in the EIR. So if you start with the EIR, you're going to have uh, a pretty good uh, understanding of the project well before you get the staff report. So. We can send you um, a link to the staff report, I mean to the EIR. We'll go ahead and send you out the link so you can just click on it. On uh, the site visit being the same as a public hearing and a public hearing needing to have a, a, a moment for uh, public comments, uh, is that 11.30 time a set time or can it just be uh, uh, judged on on uh, on when people are there to make those public comments if there are any we were we scheduled scheduled it for 1130 because um, once again if you have more people to show up then can be accommodated on the first first tour um, we want to give everybody the opportunity to you know present public comments we want everybody to be able to hear the same comments we don't want differential information being received by various people, whether or not they're there at a certain time as compared to others. So, yeah, that is our intention, to have one set time so that everybody can go up and present their comments. Um, we're also going to uh, provide speakers, well, not speaker slips, but sheets, um, so that let's say somebody attends the 9 o'clock tour, they don't want to wait around until 11.30 to present their comments. They could just fill out the sheet and uh, leave it with the uh, planning commission clerk. Uh, Madam Chair, if there's two B2 tours, are we obligated as commissioners to attend both? Negative. 
you know, need to attend one, and we're going to repeat the exact same information on each tour to ensure that nobody's getting different information depending on which tour they attend. All right, thank you. Where is the, where is the courtyard in Marriott? What, what, which one is that? Uh, it's uh, looking at 2801 Madera Road. We'll give you all the information about where it is. We can give you a map. Um, it is located very close to the uh, landfill, yeah, just on the, uh, I guess it be the yeah. south side of the uh, 118 on yeah. Madera. Yeah, if you're coming uh, east on 118, you just exit Madera. As soon as you come down to the light, you'll see it right across the street from Are we going to meet there, or are, are so we're all going to meet there? When We're not going down from here. I mean, as a group or anything. That is correct. We'll all meet at the Courtyard Marriott, and then from there, We'll load up in the bus, and then the bus will take us to the uh, landfill site. Is there anything else? Well, then we also have the, um, the public hearing that is going to be held on that site out in Simi Valley, and that is going to be on March 24th. And I think the last time we talked about it, we agreed that it would start at 1. So we are going to be out at... Um, the City of Simi Council Chambers at 1 o'clock on the 24th. So we're, we're really going to encourage people to attend that meeting and give their public comments at that meeting. Uh, it's, we don't know how many comments we're going to get on the, on the site tour or the field investigations, but we are going to say at that time we're also going to be in the community on the 24th. Um, Are, are people are people obligated to to go to, you know say uh, say someone has an argument are they obligated to bring it up at the site visit hearing and then at the planning commission hearing before they can bring up that uh, complaint to the board of supervisors so long as they bring it up once before the um, administrative process that the county is going to hold on this permit that's sufficient you don't have to make it at every single hearing in order to make it at the actual decision-making hearing which the Board of Supervisors have and and people understand that they can just write a letter they don't actually have to attend any of these meetings as long as it gets into the record prior to the Board of Supervisors I don't know what people understand whether they understand that or not uh-huh I mean, if they put in something in writing, it becomes part of the administrative record. Mm -hmm. Your question was, do people understand? I don't know if they understand or not. I don't know what they know. You know, all we know is that we're going to have these public hearings and the opportunity is going to be given to them, as, as uh, Dan has pointed out, to give oral comment or written comment, both of which will become part of the public record and the administrative record before the uh, decision-making body, the Board of Supervisors, which I understand is going to be taking place in sometime in May. I um, the reason why I asked this is I ran into somebody at a city council uh, meeting who uh, was asking the Thousand Oaks City Council to to get involved in this, and he uh, spoke to me at that uh, you know after that uh, that meeting and said that uh, uh, it was his understanding that he didn't have to go to the site tour. And I thought, hmm, what kind of notice is, is getting put out? And, you know, you know how uh, oftentimes there's complaints, well, we didn't know, we weren't noticed. I'm just wondering what kind of proactive um, communication there, there is that's, you know, just legally required, understanding that there are things that are known and unknown, and uh, to quote Donald Runsville. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, yes, uh, we have a very extensive notification list that we've compiled throughout the processing of this project. So everyone who's requested to receive any sort of updates, notifications about the project have been added to that list. Some people have preferred to be notified by email, so they've given us their email address. Some people have preferred by uh, uh, mail, so you know we have their mailing addresses. Um, we also our notification list includes all property owners within 1,000 feet of the landfill site that's greater than the 300 foot that's required by law, um, and then also all affected responsible and trustee agencies such as 
the, all of the cities, fishing games, so on and so forth, all are receiving uh, copies of the notices for the hearings and for all the environmental documents that have been prepared for the project. Okay, well, it sounds fun. Uh, are there any items that the Planning Commission wishes to introduce? Madam Chair, since we've uh, <clears throat> been through a number of these, uh, do we have a contingency plan if the testimony should run longer than 9 o'clock that evening as far as either adjourning to a date certain, a site certain? Uh, chambers back here, uh, have we given any thought to what a contingency plan would in case we cannot complete the hearing? I think that would be at your pleasure. So if you wanted to have a second hearing, if it went past 9, and if you wanted to do it in Simi Valley, we could work with the city to do that. Yeah. So could we arrange for 6.30 Friday morning? <laughs> <laughs> I could do that. The new mom over there, I knew that was going to get a rest. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess that we would deliberate that at that time. So, um, Because my concern is if we started at Simi and then shift the second hearing back here, there could be the argument of lack of notice. I, I'm just bringing things up ahead, that's all. No, and I think that that's a good idea, and we'll work with the city of uh, Simi Valley to ensure that the room's available on a time, and we'll get some dates. Um, I, I don't know whether whether it's the county's responsibility or whether it's uh, the city of Simi Valley. I think it's terrific that um, that this idea to to bring the hearing closer to the people who um, may be impacted by this uh, uh, that we've that we're changing the venue. I think it's a terrific idea. One of the things that I recall from the Amundsen Ranch um, hearings that that two commissioners were here. Um, was that the uh, this chamber was uh, filled and there was the ability to go to uh, another room and still have uh, you still be able to see the proceedings I don't know how they did it with the with the TV um, but uh, does does Simi Valley have that is that something that the county needs to um, anticipate we are going out to Simi Valley to, to do a, a tour to look at the facilities. Um, the city manager, Mike Sedell, and I have been talking, and he says his chamber fits 250 people. I believe this room fits 150 people. So 250 people in the chamber, and we will be out there with our IT staff, um, you know, looking at the facilities and looking at the room. So we'll ask him about the overflow situation at that time if we think that we'll have over 250. I also want to point out very quickly that I see on the tentative agenda it looks like we have the incorrect address for the courtyard at the Marriott, so I'll ask Danielle to uh, change that address and send it back out with a, with a corrected address this afternoon. So you'll be receiving a new tentative schedule, but it will only have the correct address of the courtyard at the Marriott. Okay. Um, one last thing on that, uh, that afternoon meeting, that 1 to 9. Uh, is it reasonable to, to talk about a, a dinner break? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so we're looking at some food that we can have catered in. So we're, we're looking at that. So if you have a, a time in mind that you would want to start out, once again, that's up to you, too. Do you, do you want to have flexibility with something like that? Or do you want to have, uh, do, do you want to see how it goes? Or you want to, how do you want to handle that? Um, I don't have any real preference. I would think that we, we, would, we won't want to stay on prem or close to prem uh, to continue the meeting afterwards. I don't, and I don't know what the facilities are. I didn't understand what you said. You're talking about the, the meal break? Or yeah, we're starting after lunch, and I anticipate being able to, to have a good chunk of time, but then um, tummy start rumbling around. Uh, to, you know, early evening. Right. So, um, anticipating how much time it would, uh, it's reasonable for people to go grab a bite. Uh, uh, six o'clock is fine. That window, six to seven o'clock, is fine with me. But I'm, I'm flexible. Okay. And c can we just have that as a, as a concept, just depending on how um, fast or slow things go? Yeah, you can have that as a concept, and we'll, we'll ensure to have some, some food available for all of you at, at 6 o'clock, and depending on how the testimony is going or how you would like to have it, I think our plan is to provide um, food for you on site. So however long you want to take or when you want to take it, it would be up to you. Okay. I prefer Cabernet Sauvignon. 
Uh, I like strawberry in my peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> we have a tight budget here at the county. <laughs> right. Is there anything else? Okay, the meeting is adjourned.